mandate for responsible food behaviors. Um, I knew that I would be speaking to a group of, of, of uh, public service officials in regards to health care, and I want to say that I think it's our mandate. It's our mandate to protect what, this, what the public is being exposed to. In my position with Kraft Foods and head of product development, I can tell you that a food scientist will create anything that marketing tells them to do and sell it regardless of thinking about the consequences of what happens after it's on the market for an extended period of time. So in my opinion, on work with the clinic and your work in the public sector, is we have to be the watchdogs to kind of determine at least things that are affecting us and our children so very drastically. You know, I, I'm, I'm really strong about that. I want to I want to begin with saying I, um, I am not a um, uh, clinician, nor am I uh, an academic of sorts, but I've been a chef for 44 years of my life. I started uh, when I was a young, uh, young boy in uh, Cincinnati, Ohio, and wound up as a chef on a nuclear submarine during the Vietnam War. And I can tell you the importance of food on a submarine when you're underwater for 100 days with 125 guys. It's pretty incredible sometimes what happens. Uh, but the importance was very, very strong and set in an early, early part of my career that I had to understand the relationship between food and the way people behave on a very practical uh, basis. Um, as you may know, I or read in my resume, I spent uh, 14 years of my career as uh, uh, in the land of wretched excess. I was the head of food and development for the casino industry, most notably Harris and then Caesars Entertainment, uh, during which time I had an opportunity to, do, to, boof, to view food and beverage uh, in a very hedonistic, uh, indulgent way, um, much more so than you would have been in the normal processes. During that time, I had an opportunity to study food and how it affected yeah, my graduate, graduate work finished in uh, nutrition and geriatric feeding. Um, and shortly thereafter, uh, the Cleveland Clinic hired me. I was in India working in the principles of Ayurveda. The Cleveland Clinic hired me to, to head up a new a new department called Wellness under Dr. Michael Boyson, who actually is a Chicago uh, product and head of anesthesiology and pain management here, and now the head of the Wellness Clinic at the Cleveland at, at, at the Cleveland Clinic. So they hired me with the mandate of making the environment both healthy and responsible in terms of healing, wellness, recovery, mental acuity, as we developed our hospitals in Las Vegas towards Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, Huntington's disease. The correlation between food and beverage seemed to be extremely appropriate and improved cognitive thought, interrupted cognitive thought, pre-onset dementia, and uh, actually into Alzheimer's. So um, this is a chart that I actually uh, borrowed from Dr. Willits of Harvard. I get to speak with him a few times a year, and I'm honored to speak here today and be in the presence of Dr. Um, Dr. Ludwig, who I've had an opportunity to speak with many times. You can see the progression here is just as we've been described many times. Obesity, diabetes, heart disease, gout, that carries, and that's how, the, that's how the flow is kind of set up. So my speech, my, what I want to talk to you today about is, is, is how do you make these changes in a large environment. Um, Cleveland Clinic has uh, 25 million square feet under roof. We have 55 buildings, main campus 18,500 people. Our, our combined campuses in Northeastern Ohio is 46,000. So in that, we had uh, 296 vending machines. We had uh, 72 operating merchandising centers, food centers, and also the various assorted and the sundry kiosks and so forth. So to kind of wrestle all that under one roof and establish um, a, a path, it was like, Walking through, the, walking through the swamp and not trying to find any mud. It was very difficult to find a path that was clear and concise. This was our timeline that was started uh, back before I joined the clinic in July of, of uh, 2005 and moved through the banning of trans fats in February of 07 and moving again then into when we started our employee health program in May of 2008, we began free yoga, Weight Watchers, July of 08, I joined the clinic, flew back from India, joined the clinic, and was received my mandate from Dr. Toby Cos Cosgrove and uh, Dr. Royson to drastically affect the patient experience level. They were very pleased and should be very proud of the level of integrity on the clinical side that the, that the clinic offers. 
but they were not pleased with the patient experience side, nor were they pleased with the nutritional support for the healing process. So, <coughs> In 2008, in July, I joined the clinic and started to evaluate what we had to do, and I think that was key to it. We spent about three months. They spent a month in each in each unit trying to understand what their uh, what their needs were, and then we came along in um, in actually in um, September, prior to this October date here, and we started to look at all of the factors that were affecting us in food and beverage. In that same month, I uh, changed 80% of what was served in the cafeteria from processed foods and, and beverages and went into as much whole food as I could. I actually took, uh, uh, took about four months to evaluate and mitigate the impact to our vendors. When we made these changes, we have vendors, we have contact with Pepsi-Cola for our beverages and things like that. Um, so that process started. The deep fat fires went away in October. The deep fat fires went away in October, and then for, followed shortly thereafter, we started to march very, very solidly towards uh, sugared beverages. So in September, actually, September of 09 was when we made our announcement. We didn't really get it done, completely done on all the campuses and all the operations until 2010. October in 2010. It took that long to, to mitigate the challenges that came up. You know, doctors, oddly enough, were the ones that screamed the most, especially surgeons. You know, where's my Mountain Dew? You know, I got surgery in 20 minutes. I got to go my Mountain Dew. Well, you know, that's a little scary for me, but I do, but that was, the, that was the call. Nurses couldn't understand, how do I take care of my post-op patients without ginger ale, sugar ginger ale? So Dr. Cosgrove took the mantle. He said, that's whatever. And he said, that's not, that's not going to happen anymore. So we do not serve sugar ginger ale nor do we serve Mountain Dew or any of those things. At that time, in October of 2009, we opened up the Miller Heart Center, which is our number one um, building. We serve, we serve 1,250 patients at, uh, at a meal period there three times a day, 365. We run a census of uh, between 90 and 95% um, in, those, in those areas, so there's a lot, a lot of traffic, a lot of things to be considered um, as, as we went into that area. We also removed full fat milk at that same time. We don't go with 1% milk. So big changes very quickly, a lot, a lot of static, a lot of people who were concentrated actually on the consequences of the decision, not on making it a successful decision. So I had a sign printed up over my door because I received so many people. I said, change is inevitable, pain and suffering are optional. <laughs> 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 We did not allow those things. We concentrated on the success, and with that, we mitigated the fear of failure. We just knew it was the right thing to do. Dr. Cosgrove put a stake in the sand. He said, this is what's happening. We're not going to change. We're not moving back. And it's progressed very, very nicely um, through that period of time. Of course, we coincided in there, too. I remapped all the vending machines. I can share that with any of you that you'd like. I took every vending machine on the property. At that time, it was 146 candy vending machine. I revised them all to health, all to healthy snacks, uh, responsible snacks. At the same time, we were doing the same thing with the beverage, the beverage containers too. But again, our our challenges were mitigating the the revenue loss for our vendors, who are long-term partners, 120 years, 119 mitigating that, and then also mitigating the financial impact to the clinic itself. Because you all know there's market dollars that are shared, given basically payola for using our products that are done through the, through the system. So we had to approach that whole situation. We had to lose about $425,000 a year in marketing funds, which as you know in our business, it's not, it's not good to go up funding on any level. So we were very, very comfortable with, with what we had to do at that point. We've continued on and we've continued on with the march. We've implemented a lot of the bio, a, a lot of these programs since that time. This is all tied to the employee health program. The employee health program. Well, this is oh, this is another tragedy. I'll come back to this in a minute. But our waste management program from 8,000 from from August uh, uh, August the 30th, uh, 2008 until August the 30th of 2010, we lost 300,000 pounds. This is one of the best. 300,000 pounds in a test group of 8,000 people. We reduced pharmacological dependency within that group by 
very impressive numbers as far as the doctors were concerned. And, and that's what sold our program right there. And we celebrate this every single day, and now there's an attachment, part of the caveat of this, by the way, is there's a carrot. If you maintain a program of, of Weight Watchers, or, you know, uh, Shake and Go, Fitness Centers, these various attributes here, and the things that we've implanted, if you do that, you'll realize that between a 9 and a 12% um, or 17% reduction in your health care premiums. So that's what the staff bid on, and that's what they ran at that point in time. So I can see I'm getting flashed over here as far as things are concerned. Um, the, the one I want to back up to is I think this is a tragedy. This is a tragedy. This was published in the USA Today two weeks ago. We're, cele we're not celebrating, but this is what's going on out there as far as obesity rates in various cities, the top five in the country, by the way. But look at the money involved in these different types of expenses that we move through the cities. And I think the fact that we even know this is scary. It's scary. I spent 18 years of my career outside of the country in cultures where food is medicine. Food is what they use to treat themselves with. Teas, herbs, spent a lot of time in India with the principles of the, of the Ayurveda. I know we can be a lot more successful with that. And it's up to us. It's up to people in the public health sector to make sure we vanguard and we and, and, and we out in front of information like this. It's so, so disappointing, uh, at least for me. My children live in Texas, and I'm always very cognizant of this, of this report. So I don't really have a whole lot of time to talk about this. I can just tell you that you got to have courage to do this. you got to believe in the result. And, you know, we quoted Hippocrates earlier. One of the other things he said was, was that, uh, let food be thy medicine. That was his other quote. And I think we have to start looking at everything that we serve in our organizations and around us to be responsible in nature to what the humankind needs. So I don't really have a lot. This, the next things I put together were kind of slides I borrowed from Dr. Willett's uh, portion distortion over the years have driven our has driven us to be really, really confused. Um, now we're at 350 calories on 140 bagel. So 20 years ago I ate that bagel and today I'm getting I'm getting a whole lot more than I ever did in the past. Coffee the same way, 45 calories, now it's 350 calories. 500 calories now in a and I very very much and the treat it was 250. And these are things that we can all control within our operations. Calories. 20 years ago, 500 calories for a slice of pizza. Today, 850 calories for that same amount of pizza. So, uh, 450 calories on a chicken stir fry 20 years ago, two cups. How many today? 865 with four and a half cups. I've also gone through all my operations, reduced all the portion sizes, went off on pan. All the people that supply me forced their people to reduce the size of their day in terms of the basic amount of flour within that product to a more responsible less than 200 calorie total. We were not paternalistic at the clinic. We published, we serve indulgent food. We do. We have a cookie with 650 calories. We have it. But we publish everything we serve has a published analysis in five different food groups so that they make the decision that they want to eat that or not. So that's how we've mitigated that. You can't tell me what to do. Okay, I'm not, but I'm going to show you that there's an option. And we put them side by side. Okay? and we're rewarding them for behaviors. So there's not much more I have to say. If there's questions, I'm sure we're gonna answer them now in a few minutes, but if you're anybody's considering this process, I want you to know it can and will be done. I do a lot of webinars. Everybody says, oh God, how about this person? That? Don't worry about that. Your mission is to protect your environment, the wellness and the health of your people. I don't wanna be part of a disease recovery facility. I wanna be part of a wellness facility one that promotes long-term care, long-term health, and a more enjoyable uh, life for everyone. So, thank you.